Yes, then. Uh, good morning, my name is Martin Cuthbert. I'm Managing Director of WebTech Products. Um, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, optimizing and maintaining hydraulic efficiency on mobile machinery. Um, it's a talk which we've given a couple of times this year. Um, interestingly, at the IVT, which is Industrial Vehicle Technology Show, um, which was in Cologne in Germany and in America in Chicago, um, where they're talking about machinery which has increasingly got um, electrical drives on it, battery, um, and replacing diesel engines, not yet replacing the hydraulics, but certainly replacing um, diesel engines on some of those machines. Um, and so we're just talking really about how does the hydraulic efficiency and what part does that play in, in the whole design of a machine. Um, and to illustrate that, we thought it'd be kind of fun to, to talk about it from the point of view of a, of a company designing a new machine. Um, and so we're going to talk about a construction machinery company that builds, uh, that wants to build a next generation machine. Um, and to do that, we thought about designing an autonomous uh, dumper truck. Hey Good morning. But the principles we're going to talk about really could apply to any hydraulic machine. And, and they've got three, three guys, or th three, three people, excuse me, not guys, but three people who are responsible for, for this machine. And it's their challenge to bring out this next generation machine. And they've got Declan, um, he's a design engineer. He's responsible for designing the machine. Um, they've got Paula, um, she's responsible for promoting the machine and getting the, the sales channels to, to buy into it. Um, and perhaps most importantly, they've got Steve, and Steve's responsible for servicing the machine and thinking really before the machine's designed about what's most important about how they might service this machine. Um, and overall, um, their aim is to design a new machine, mobile hydraulic machine, which will have lower energy consumption, um, reduce downtime, and, and increase the output of it. Probably fairly typical challenges for, for most of us. So their ambition um, is defined by their, by their CEO, Vim. Um, he wants to be the market leader. He has a very Everest-like ambition about how many machines he wants to sell. Um, and he thinks that they're going to sell thousands of these machines. And that really sets the challenge for, for the, three, uh, the three key members of the team. And so Declan's challenge is really to design a machine which has got lower CO2 and a lower cost of sale. Um, quite a challenge. Uh, Paula's is to, to come up with a machine which is going to stop the competitors overtaking us. That's her concern. Um, and Steve's challenge is perhaps a bit more philosophical. He's going, well, it should just be better. Um, it should be better and more sustainable, uh, the machine. So that's, that's kind of what's going through the heads of these guys um, as they think about uh, bringing out this next, next range of machines. Uh, and overall, they've got pressure from above going, right, we've got to make sure this works. So, so where does WebTech come into this? Um, some of you may know us for test equipment. Some of you may know us for, for flow control valves. Um, we've been fortunate that we've been in the business for nearly 60 years, that we've dealt with an awful lot of people over that time, and a lot of people use our, um, our equipment, and we get feedback from people saying, oh, this is good, this doesn't work quite so well, how could we use this differently? And we've got these different applications. Um, and so these are the, often the, the needs that we hear about from, from end users, whether it's trying to reduce warranty, um, improving control on a machine, uh, monitoring machine and component efficiency, could be safety related, um, or pump health, um, but most of the time it's about reducing downtime. And so what we've put together really just to illustrate that today and make it um, perhaps easier to, to explain is go, we've put this into a three-step plan. Um, and the first step is to think about a combination of maintenance that you might want to apply to a machine. And, and to illustrate that, we've taken a machine that all of us can relate to and go, so different parts of that machine, of that car, um, will need maintenance at different times. And the first thing might be that things just go wrong and you replace them once they've gone wrong. So the wiper blades will start smearing or the light bulbs will blow and we'll go, okay, we'll go and replace them now that they've broken, we'll replace them. And we would do that as a form of reactive maintenance. So that's one of the approaches that we would commonly, commonly take. But there are other things um, on the car where you take it in for a service and they say, yeah, time's up, you've done whatever, 120,000 miles, let's change the cam belt. Um, or the 30,000 miles since we changed the oil, let's change it. And that approach is backed up by lots of data. Hundreds of thousands or millions of, of, of car miles have gone into deciding when's a good time to change those components. Um, and that approach 
um, would be summarised as being preventive maintenance. So we're changing it before it fails because the cost of that cam belt breaking could be catastrophic to the car and you might write the car off. Um, the cost of the belt is relatively small. So another approach um, which increasingly you would see on a car is that you monitor um, brake pad wear and tyre pressure um, and that would tell you uh, when to do the appropriate maintenance and that you could term as being predictive maintenance. And then lastly, there'll be things that will go wrong on the car um, which you can't predict and maybe you can't prevent. The lorry in front of you sheds its load, you hit some of that load and you blow up a tyre. Um, and that then um, would be you'd carry some sort of alternative, um, carry a, a run flat or a spare tyre and that you then call proactive maintenance. So we've got a toolbox of four different types of maintenance that we can use, um, and it's about which combination do we use at which time. If we were to look at that as uh, a kind of logic tree and say, right, the aim of the game really is to move as much um, of our maintenance to plan maintenance and have as little as possible as troubleshooting. Um, so the first thought process there is looking at the green box and saying, OK, can we stop it going wrong in the first place? Because if we do that, that's the cheapest for everybody. If you can't do that, well, then what could we do instead? Um, and can we monitor its condition? So can we do predictive maintenance like we do with the tyre pressure? So, OK, can we monitor that and then tell the operator um, that we need to get some maintenance planned? And if that's then either not affordable or, or, or not easy to do, then... Um, we can move to preventive maintenance where we use the data that we have already and say, OK, um, on the basis of that data, we think we should change the, the hoses every two years or the filters um, every six months or, or whatever that component is. And can we predict when it's going to fail and change it beforehand? Um, and if, if none of that's possible, then we're left just with reactive and you go, OK, let's just stock up with spares and have the right spares in the right place at the right time. And that would then bring you to a troubleshooting approach. So if we were to look at um, hydraulic circuit diagram here and, and say, OK, well, how might we then apply the different maintenance approaches to that circuit? We could colour code it and say, OK, we could use this, this approach for this part of the circuit. So if we colour code it into three colours and, and we've got blue there for preventive, green for predictive and, and pink for proactive. If we look at the preventive, you can see um, going around and changing hoses. Uh, looking at filters, that could all be part of a, a scheduled maintenance program. Predictive, normally investment in certain sensors, so there's flow sensors and pressure sensors, um, maybe level sensors, frequency sensors that could go onto the circuit and give information, vital information about the health of the circuit so that you can take action before there's a problem. And then you can see uh, in pink uh, the proactive side of it. This is clearly quite a critical um, conveyor system um, because they've built a whole load of redundancy on the left-hand side. So the whole of that, um, of that pump circuit has been duplicated on the left so that if there were to be a failure, the system definitely doesn't go down because you've got a whole uh, redundant circuit to the left. Um, and you've also then got a kidney loop filter uh, on top of the tank. So that could be part of the proactive maintenance to stop there being downtime on that machine. That decision as to which type of maintenance is clearly down to the designer and, and what the cost of downtime is in that, in that industry. So if you were to look at those and say, OK, let's look at the cost of the maintenance uh, equipment across the x-axis and the cost of downtime up the y-axis, we've got some extremes there, some perhaps slightly silly extremes. We've got a nuclear reactor. We don't want that to go wrong under any circumstances, so we're willing to throw quite a lot of money at it, and we can put a lot of effort into proactive and predictive uh, maintenance um, top right hand corner. If it's something which really doesn't really matter if it's a problem or not, TV remote control, um, if it doesn't work, I can walk up and switch the television on or off. Um, I can just change the batteries when I need to. So those extremes, probably most of us would sit somewhere in the middle um, where we'd have downtime is inconvenient. How inconvenient depends what industry you're in. Um, if the cost, if there's a penalty associated with it, penalty associated with maybe transferring fluids off of a, off of a large ship, Maybe there's, you know, if you're there for an extra hour, you get charged a whole lot of money for not moving a ship, then that downtime goes into the calculation. If it's something where you've got two or three of those units and, and if one doesn't work, then you can use a different one, then you've got redundancy anyway and maybe it's not so critical. But that dictates to an extent how much um, it's worth investing in the maintenance equipment. So if we were to look at those four different maintenance types that, that um, were shown for the car and just summarise them, we've got reactive, which is basically uh, wait for it to go wrong and then fix it. Um, still a lot of that that happens in this industry. 
Um, partly maybe because the downtime cost isn't that high. Um, maybe it's because people don't appreciate um, what the alternatives are. And I guess that's what the NFPC is about, is, is enlightening people um, about what the alternatives are. Preventative, um, estimate when it will go wrong and fix it before it does. Predictive, monitor its condition and fix it when necessary. And proactive, try to stop it going wrong or minimise the consequences of a failure. So if the first step is to think about which mixture of, of maintenance approaches you might want to use, the second step is to say, OK, so what tools could you use to then go and look at the maintenance? And so here we've got a whole array of different sensors, um, quite a few of them that come from WebTech, some of them that don't, um, but measuring all sorts of things, flow, pressure, temperature, frequency, um, mostly those things, to be honest with you, um, infrared. <coughs> Uh, uh, rotation, there's a few different things there. But the question really for the, for the designers of the machine is to say what input, uh, so three questions, why is it important um, that we know certain parameters? Why is it important we know the flow or we know the pressure or we know the temperature in a particular place? And, and that followed up with the second question is what are we going to do differently once we know that information? If we're going to shut down the machine as a safety thing then that's really important. If we're just going to have that information and go OK, that's interesting, but I'm not going to do anything with it. Then how, how affordable is it to go and put those sensors onto the machine? And then the last question really is who is going to interpret or, or, or read the, the, the data? Um, because if you're asking the end user to do it, you've got to make it really simple um, to be able to get the information out. If you've got a qualified engineer on there, then, then you can have a different interface to it. Uh, and for many customers, it's about saying, OK, we want to pull that information and share it with, with service head office so they can look at information from different machines at the same time. So if we just look at some, some application examples then around uh, the different approaches and the different tools that might be used for those different approaches. Um, so from a reactive point of view, wait for it to go wrong, then fix it. Probably um, historically the most common application that we've seen um, as a manufacturer of, of test equipment is people coming to us and saying, my machine's broken down. Um, I need some kit to go and see what's gone wrong on the machine. Um, and so here are an example, um, screening crushing machine. Um, there's a blue box tester that probably many people will have seen before. There's a few of them in the lab next door, uh, measuring flow pressure and temperature, got a loading valve in it. And, and the first place that most people would start is say, okay, is the pump delivering um, what it should deliver? So we'd open up the hatch um, and we'd then be able to carry out uh, a PQ test on the pump and just look at the efficiency of the pump and say, OK, if I, if I ramp up um, the load on the pump, if I screw in the load valve, I can increase the pressure. What happens to the, to the efficiency of the pump? Um, and where is that compared to what it should be? Yeah, so we've got the green and the, and the red lines there. And we'll just move down those lines and see how far apart we are. Um, it might also be used to set up the relief valve. Um, but that's the, pretty much the standard tool that we see people using um, from a reactive point of view of going, okay, start with how we've got enough flow coming out of the pump. Um, is the pump operating as it should be? So there's a bit more about how that device works. Essentially, you've got a flow meter, um, a pressure sensor in there. Um, you've also got temperature, and then you've got a safety burst disk system just to make sure that you don't, don't screw that load valve in too far um, and accidentally overpressurize uh, the unit. So there's, there's one approach, um, wait, for what's gone, wait for things to go wrong and then test and see if we can find out, troubleshoot where the problem is. Um, fairly versatile tool that you can use in different parts of the machine. But what else could you do? So from a preventive point of view, um, we want to estimate when it will go wrong and fix it before it does. Um, and for that you need a lot of data. So if we look at some data here, um, data on the lifespan of different piston pumps on a machine, and you can see the number of failures um, at, different, at different life, at different thousands of hours plotted across the bottom. Um, and you can see quite a peak to the left. And, and we could probably assume that that's down to poor commissioning of the pumps um, and that with some training we could address that. And so perhaps we can take that part away and go, all right, we'll, we'll ignore the ones to the left because really a pump shouldn't fail at, at 500 hours. Um, so we look at the normal distribution of when things fail, and that's a pretty standard distribution, just the age may, the number of hours may move depending on which component it is. The question then is, from a designer's point of view, when would you replace that pump? You know, would you wait until 10,000 hours, um, because that's the midpoint, but then 
you've already got um, some components that already, uh, have already failed. If you replaced it, at, let's say 4,000 hours, ultra safe, but then you've got perhaps some pumps in there which you've got 6,000 hours of life left in and you've thrown the pump away, and what a waste of money that is. Um, and if you, the more you move to the right, clearly the more risk there is. So preventative works very well if you've got very reliable and repeatable data um, on, on components um, and the spread isn't too wide. What, could you, what tools could you use um, to, to, to monitor this machinery? Just kind of given three examples here, really a very simple setup where you've just got one, uh, one input, one channel, one pressure that you want to monitor. So here's a, a, a portable digital pressure gauge, um, could have an output on it so you can feed data out um, and feed it onto a screen and then you can say, okay, I'll look at the pressure spikes or capture pressure spikes over 24 hours and see, see if anything's happening there and use that as a way um, to, to see if the system's operating as planned. Maybe a more complex setup, if we go back to the, um, the screening and crushing machine, um, there may be a, a situation where you need to monitor flow pressure and temperature or a couple of pressures and, and flow and temperature, um, maybe for setting up the machine. Uh, you could also use it then to, to periodically go back and test the machine every six months and say, okay, how's the performance now compared to six months ago? Download it. So you go back to those questions about why are you doing it, what you're going to do differently, and who's going to use it. If you can download the information, then you can share it with other people uh, in the company. And then you might have a, a really complex machine. Um, you might have high inertia loads on a machine. How do you then monitor all those sensors simultaneously? Well, there are bigger data loggers. Uh, this one, HPM 7000, can take up to, to 50 different inputs. You can then use that data and, and overlay different graphs um, of different, uh, different data points, flow pressure and temperature in that example. But you may have taken data from six months ago and you want to compare them on top of each other and go, OK, is, is the performance noticeably different? So that, that covers the, the first two, reactive and preventive. And um, what's interesting about both of those, in 99% of cases, our experience is people, that people bring that equipment to the machine, they plug it in, they carry out a test, they remove the equipment again afterwards. If we move to predictive maintenance, then we're talking about continuous monitoring, and there you're talking about leaving the equipment permanently mounted on the machine. Why would you do that? You do that so that you're getting real-time performance. Um, so if you look at this pump, and, and look at the pump performance. You think about that PQ test, if you like, that we were doing beforehand, um, just looking at the flow output from this. Over a period of time, for a lot of the time, it would be identical, the reading coming out of it, but over a longer period of time, you'd expect some degradation of that pump. And, and what you're looking for is that point when that, that curve turns down much more steeply. And if we hit that point exactly on the nose, then we have maximized the life of that pump. If we come in a bit too early, then we've wasted usage of the pump. If we come in too late, then the pump's already blown up and, and we've got a whole mess to, to sort out. So that's the ideal time to change it, which is possible because you're, you're reading the flow out of that pump continuously. And, and one of the ways to do that would then be to put um, an online flow meter onto it, um, which historically has been a bit of a challenge because the equipment that you use portably is different to the equipment that you'd install permanently. The expectation on price, the expectation on the environment it's going to be in is different. You know, if you're going to have this just installed temporarily, then you don't have to build it to, to the same ruggedness. If you're going to install it permanently, you could see massive extremes of temperature. Um, you can get salt spray. There could be all sorts of, 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 of moisture coming into it that it then presents a different challenge um, for us as a manufacturer of, of sensors. Why do you want that information? Well, that information could, say, be permanently installed. You could transmit data to the cloud um, and you could view the current system performance. And I think there's a talk, the one after the next one, talking about IoT and, and how you can use data from machines. Ultimately, you want to predict the, the problems before they occur. So we just look at that flow meter. Um, for us, this has been quite um, an interesting challenge where we've had customers coming to us and saying, historically, we've just plugged them in temporarily to carry out service, now we want to leave them in permanently. Can you do that? We've gone, yeah, what do you want? And they're going, well, we want it to be smaller, we want it to be lighter, we want it to be cheaper, but by the way, we also want it IP69K because the environment's horrible. Um, we're going, okay, and, and we're getting there. The jury's out as to whether they think it's cheap enough. It's never, it's always a Ferrari for a pound. Everybody wants everything and, and not pay much for it. But um, 
The first iteration was with um, CAN, CAN J1939. Latest iteration is now with 4 to 20 milliamp, um, but it's been very reliable um, from the application it's gone into, and really some of the applications from a hydraulics point of view are quite, quite arduous. How does that work? You've got a turbine inside. Um, as the flow goes through it, turbine speeds up. You get a signal out, um, which is not linear, but you, you use the electronics package to then turn it into a flow signal. And we've also been measuring temperature at the point of the flow. And the opportunity stands there as well to add pressure to it. Um, there is one being used here if you go into the lab at the end. I don't know, is it Graham? Is it still connected? There was one off on yeah. one of the mobile machines at the end. Yeah. Um, so we've got various different applications, on and off highway applications, where people are moving to that predictive monitoring of pumps um, so they can get real time feedback um, and prevent downtime. What do people use it for? If we go back to the, the autonomous dumper truck, um, allows you to look at cycle times. As we saw on the graph before, that the degradation in pump performance can be very slow. And for a lot of time, the operator won't notice the difference. But that cycle time could just get you know, a few minutes longer each time, which for someone operating a fleet is important information to know that basically the efficiency and the amount of work that, that machine's going to get done in a day is decreasing. So they can get that in real time. Equally, if you're measuring flow and pressure, you've now got power. If you've got speed as well, you've got torque. You can start looking how hard the machine is working. And so you can use that. Some of the, the people we're talking to, IVT, were interested from the point of view, if you've got an electric motor being driven from a battery, how much power am I consuming? How long is my battery going to last? You could look at how much power you're consuming at the front end and compare to the amount of power you've got uh, um, coming from the, the original source. That feeds into energy efficiency. So we could look at the overall efficiency of, of a component or of the whole system. And from that, we then move on to, to proactive. So we've talked about the first three. Um, the fourth one then is to try and stop it going wrong um, or minimize the consequences of failure. And probably the best example in our industry is, is about pre-dispatch inspection. Um, so taking two different components, so in this case, a breaker and putting it onto an excavator and, and the breaker manufacturer goes, yeah, you've got to set it up like this. And the excavator manufacturer says, yeah, we'll provide this much flow at this pressure. If it doesn't work, who do I point to? Both of you. And so the, the, the good operators out there will commission and, and, and carry out PDI on the um, breaker when it's first set up on an excavator, just to make sure that it's operating um, correctly. What are they setting up? Well, if you look at um, a variable displacement piston pump, it could be the maximum flow, standby pressure, um, compensator pressure. And all of those things are then relatively easy um, to set up if you've got the right tools. And that tool could be um, a portable tester, it could be a data logger. Um, that depends a little bit more on, on who the operator is and what you're doing with the information. But there's an example of preventing the problems before they could happen by making sure that things were set up when they left the factory. So we just summarized the different maintenance approaches we talked about. So we had reactive, preventive, um, predictive, um, proactive. So from the point of view of our, our three-step plan, the first step was to assess the best maintenance combination, which are those four approaches. And, and for most people, it's a combination of all four of those approaches um, which you use. Uh, the second step then may, may be to select standard or custom tools, so whether it's um, a standard data logger or, or a, um, a special version for a particular application. Um, and then from WebTech's point of view, we're, we're there to support people um, for the lifetime of that product and that machine. So if we go back to the original um, plan, which was for this next generation machine to be developed, um, reduce energy consumption, reduce downtime, um, increase output. Our aim is that those, those three decision makers um, that Declan is a design engineer, he understands now what his options are, that Paul is confident um, that they can bring out a machine that will, that will compete well, um, and from Steve's point of view, that they can plan the maintenance. <laughs> so there's just uh, three products as an example there. So you've got portable testers, could fit into either the reactive or proactive maintenance. 
um, portable data loggers, preventive or proactive maintenance, and then say units that you can install permanently on the machine that could be for predictive maintenance. And to say we're fortunate to be at the NFPC because there's an awful lot of this equipment in, in the labs that are here um, and you can see them working. Um, we do have a little maintenance quiz um, on our website. If you want to have a go at that, it just asks you some questions about what do you do and gives you a score of how effective you are at reactive, preventive, proactive, um, and predictive maintenance in your own business. Um, it's just a bit of fun. It feeds through to some resources um, about other training material that you can get hold of, including some, I think, that are delivered here. So, okay. And we're also um, next door um, in the pavilion and we have a little stand there if you want to look at any of the products. And that's it. Any questions? Okay. It's, it's definitely going forward to condition based monitoring stuff. It's, it's, it's the way forward, absolutely. It's way pushing out the sentence, right? Yeah, I think it's just interesting for me how there's such a wide range of, 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 of approaches within the industry. There are still customers in there, out there, who they wait for the machine to fail, and then they didn't even know there were any tools to go and diagnose the system. Yeah. Now, a lot of people don't know that. And, and, and you know, they're kind of still at the, I'll touch the pipe and see what the flow is. So it feels warm, might be some flow in there. Um, and then at the other end, you've got people who have designed the whole machine with all the condition monitoring on it, and, and they won't even let you break into it anymore. They're going, well, if I break into it, I'll introduce contamination. So if the sensor's not on there to start with, you can't touch it. And, and we see customers at both extremes, probably more, to be honest with you, at the extreme where they're going, um, I need to buy my first tester, or you know, how do we diagnose yeah, the system? A bit funny. Uh, I'll go and test it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But yeah. that's fine. We're all at different stages of the journey, aren't we? And it's about what we yeah. want to do is just help people improve the efficiency of their machinery in whatever way we can. And, and, and if that means designing new versions, then that's what we're very happy to do. Um, and the predictive maintenance part has come out of that is customers coming to us and going, yeah, I know we can go and break into the circuit when it's gone down, but much better if we could actually monitor it in real time. Um, and then, then the discussion moves to the business case. It kind of moves to, okay, I've got to add this to the machine up front, but do I understand what the cost of downtime is? Because if I know the cost of downtime is the mining industry and it's $150,000 an hour, it's pretty easy to decide to go and put some equipment onto it permanently. If, if it's £2.50 of my downtime, well, okay, then maybe we'll just stick to, you know, troubleshooting and reactive maintenance. But... I think the biggest thing with this planting as well is the lead time for components now. You know, some of these components you've been talking about could be a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, if you haven't got them in stock, then, then yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, if you can predict that, then you can predict having the right components in the yeah. right place at the right yeah, time. Absolutely. Yeah. Can reduce your inventory massively as well. Sorry? I said, can reduce your inventory massively as well. Yeah. Keep on stock, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, Everything, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. It's as expensive to do that. Yeah, and, and we have conversations with the larger manufacturers, you know, the, the Caterpillars and the John Deere's and people, and you can clearly see that that's their strategy is to use all of that data and then apply some machine learning to it and go, okay, we know the probability is that it's going to be this area that might have failed, and therefore the, these components that might be used. Yeah. Um, they're they're at one end of the spectrum. There's a whole load of companies at the other end of the spectrum um, who, are, who are playing catch up. Well, that's interesting. Um, so we spoke to a couple of customers about that, and the reality is that they're kind of going, we're going to put it on the machine, and you'll probably not see it back until the machine comes in for an overhaul five years down the road. So we've, the customer's needs are less about having ultimate traceable accuracy, and they are more about repeatability. Yeah, so if the machine is delivering 80 litres out of that pump today, I want to know when it starts going down to 75 or 70. If that 80 litres, if I were to traceably calibrate it, is actually only ever 78, do I care? What I care about is how my machine is progressing over time. So the discussion has moved away from, if it was a test bench customer and he was you know, testing a pump that just been refurbished and he wanted to say categorically that was the flow through the pump, that's a, that's a flow meter user. But what we're seeing on the machines is a more of a flow monitor. And what's the difference? That one's the emphasis is on repeatability and the other one's the emphasis is on accuracy. And so 
we're looking at it going, what's going to fail? Yeah, it's got moving parts, it's got turbine in it, but we know that the greatest um, problem for, for a moving part is contamination. So we just build it into the contract and they've got it in any way that they've got to hit this ISO spec on, on, on cleanliness on their circuit, yeah. which if you're not breaking into the circuit is easier to maintain than if you're breaking into it all the time. And they've got other components on there, whether it's valves or pumps, which if they've got high contamination are also going to fail. So I think the, 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 the larger volume manufacturers are already pretty savvy to that and they're going, we just don't want anybody to be breaking into the circuit if possible. Yeah, so, so the answer, yes, you could send it back. The reality is we don't expect that many people will unless they had a catastrophic failure somewhere on the circuit and then they go, did the flow meter get affected? Okay. okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for your time, everybody. Okay.